This is a unique podcast exploring the criminal justice system and those involved and affected. We'll educate and expose the public as well as potential jurors to what takes place behind the scenes of those who are facing the system. Your host owns a litigation support firm called Justice Technology Professionals, and he works on criminal and civil cases offering support to defendants and counsel. What you're about to hear is an open dialogue, opening the minds to the public, to what takes place in reality, as opposed to what you think takes place. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Justice Tech Pros Podcast. Here's your host, Dominic Crea. Hello, listeners. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, Wanted to put out an episode today. What's uh, something that I wrote down that I wanted to touch on for a while now is how uh, the interpretation, how um, things are always up for interpretation as it applies to the law many times. And a lot of people don't realize that. And I know they don't because you get a lot of people who just, uh, I'll hear them on the on their platform and they'll, they'll cite certain things, they'll cite statute, they'll cite laws and say, okay, that's it, that's the law. They don't understand that it plays out in interpretation. And what I mean by that Anytime you're submitting motions, anytime you're dealing in the court system, the justice system, there's always going to be two sides. You have the prosecution side who will interpret the law, obviously, to try to um, reflect the point that they're making, that the law support supports their argument. And you have the defense who will do the same thing. And each side will always cite different cases. There's different cases on on many sides of the law, that'll prove either the defense's point or the prosecution's point. And then it's up for the judge to really interpret that. So people will will often say, well, this is the law, this is how it works. That's not necessarily true. There's a lot of room for interpretation. That has a lot to do with the judge. The judge is, that's why they're judges. They'll go on there and they're judging whose argument's stronger, whose argument falls in line more so with the law. And... That's why I laugh at myself, or I, I laugh to myself. Well, I laugh at myself sometimes too, but I laugh, I laugh to myself when I see a people coming on and making claims or showing paperwork and saying it's ironclad and this is how it is. And that's why I always, my advice is always you have to investigate further. You have to look at minutes. You have to follow the case. You have to see what the judge said at the hearings. You have to read the minutes, see what the judge's interpretation may have been at the time, see what the arguments were, and then and then that's where you kind of find out why they reached a conclusion they reached or why there was a disposition that was reached, whatever it may be. And, and that's what I want to explore a lot. I want to explore today is the interpretation. Uh, people will, especially when you're dealing with the defendants or you're dealing with the defense team, you'll put together a phenomenal argument sometimes. You'll have a lot of citations, a lot of case law to support your argument, support the point you're trying to make, and then you'll submit it, and the judge will pretty much say, ah, well, I don't see it that way. uh, I'm not going to apply it that way. I'm going to apply it a little differently, and they'll deny your motion. And now before that, right, the defense team would be like, oh, we can't lose. This is citing the law. This is citing the cases. This is showing that our argument is supported by past case law rulings. But that's not so. The bottom line is it's going to be up to the judge. The judge has to look at your argument. The judge has to look at the prosecution's argument. And then they have to decide what's really a stronger argument and what makes sense in the eyes of that sitting judge. And that's, I don't want to say scary is the word for it, but that's a little, I guess, unsettling. And I've talked about this many times. That's why the saying goes, don't tell me what the law is, tell me who the judge is. Because that's really what it boils down to. It's up to the judge's interpretation at that time. And that's why you have people who win an appeal. Because uh, uh, when it goes to the appe- uh, appellate court, you have three judges looking at it at the federal level. They they may disagree with what the lower court's decision was, and they'll overturn it. That's why you have the whole appeal process, to make sure that whatever rulings went on, the appellate court looks at it and, and compares it to how the law reads, and see if it was in line of the law or ever, or any errors or mistakes were made. And, and people don't grasp that. And, and I want to I want to explore also the fact that um, I think a, a lot of people have the wrong intention, uh, wrong idea 
of what my goals are for We Push Back, for my podcast. I, I know a lot of people think uh, that I'm on a crusade for my, for my pop, which I am personally, I'm on a crusade, but here's the truth, people. What I do on here doesn't really help uh, my father's case too much directly. And let me explain that. When it all whittles down, I'm not concerned about the messages on here and how it could help uh, my father's case or the support could help his case. That's all phenomenal. Don't misunderstand me. It's all appreciated. And what's important about that, in my opinion, is just public awareness on different cases. Not only cases I've been involved in or cases that are personal to me, just any case. Any case where there was um, misconduct, where somebody was being prosecuted unfairly, where lying informants took place, all of that needs to be exposed. Now, when something's in an appeal, like the case I'm dealing with now, my father's case, the, the appellate judges aren't going to listen to all these podcasts, go to We Push Back and say, oh yeah, all right, let, let's rule in their favor because of all this. <laughs> I don't live in a fantasy world. Now, you have a lot of the opposition who they'll push that narrative. They'll say, oh, Dominic's doing this, he's trying to... Uh, I think somebody said taint the jury and all this crazy stuff. Well, the jury doesn't decide appellate level uh, cases. And I wouldn't call what I do tainting anybody. What I do is putting the information out there. Uh, and for those who are maybe unaware, those who are maybe uh, closed off to certain sides of things, I put as much out there so they have the ability to review all the different sources, all the different podcasts, all the different information, and then conclude. Basically, I'm just adding another source of information for them, for them to contemplate before they draw conclusions. And my goal with We Push Back, with um, my podcast, it's all about exposure to the public, building more informed jurors, and hopefully future defendants just get a fair trial. That's all it boils down to. We always hear, oh, they want to get bad guys out of jail. Those are morons. Those are ignorant people. And those are always informant allies. So they, they don't like what I have to say, which I get. But that's not what it's about. It's just about exposure. It's about bringing things to the public that they're not aware of. Building a more, maybe in future generations, a more educated juror base. And not based on what I'm doing. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think this is going to have that much pull or gravity in any way. But I think the culmination, some people may hear my podcast and it may take them to somewhere else, the, different things. It's all about the culmination, just different sources of information out there for the public to be able to pull upon and, and learn from. So getting back to my point, while all the support and all that means a lot for, all, for, for especially personally, I, I, I take that very seriously and I was actually humbled and, and I still am by the positive feedback I get, uh, by the emails I get, by the letters I get, by the phone calls I get. I even get mails at, mail at my office. And all of that means more than anybody could realize because I didn't anticipate any of that. To be honest, I, I pictured me coming on here and being more of a one-man army. I didn't really expect to have um, any allies when it came to this, only because I guess I was so used to seeing all of these informant podcasts and how everybody was all over all these informants. So I laughed to myself before I started. I said, okay, here we go. This is going to be opening up <laughs> open up a can of worms, but it is what it is. So I, I was pleasantly surprised. And then uh, obviously with that became the development of We Push Back. I found a lot of like-minded individuals. And, and that's, that's another story. You know, that just uh, uh, created its own thing. A and people don't understand this isn't about bringing attention to one to one issue. Yes, I like to bring attention to my father's case. Uh, I'm a son, who wouldn't? If I feel something was done unjustly, I wanna bring attention to it. And that's just the way I am. If, if my father went to, to uh, trial and he received a fair trial, well, I would just probably, I don't even know if I would be doing this. I may not get inspired to even do this. I'd just keep doing my thing and moving along uh, because I wouldn't have maybe experienced firsthand how corruption could take place, how these informants lie through their teeth. So I, I don't know. I, I can't really talk on that. I don't know what would have happened. But being I saw a case involving somebody I care about where lies were just being spread on the stand, 
that's what kind of motivated me. And that's what kind of made me say, hey, you know what? I bet a lot of the public isn't aware that this goes on. Let me see if I could break down that barrier. Let me see if I could connect with certain listeners, not to have them agree with me, not to have them say everything I say is gospel, just to give them another perspective, just to give them further insight on what goes on in the courtroom. That, that was really my goal and continues to be my goal. So I laugh when, when the other side, you got these channels, you got these content created channels. I have a stalker now with a clip channel. He's infatuated with myself, my father. I think he spent all day doing uh, posts. <laughs> posts. So I don't know. I, I pictured him like a Silence of the Lambs. Remember, remember when the guy was putting lipstick on in the mirror? That's what I pictured. That's what I pictured taking place. Either that or the other picture I, I have in my head of this guy is wearing the tinfoil hat. And he's got like that huge board, you know, the uh, yard map where they use the yarn and they, they map it out with the little uh, push pins. I picture him doing a nice yarn mat, yarn map going through everything with wearing the tinfoil hat. Those are two images in my head, Buffalo Bill and the yarn map guy. I even think some people refer to that as a conspiracy board, you know, with the yarn and you're attaching all the pins with people's pictures on it. But But my point just is, I anticipated all of that. These are all people, These clip, this clip channel guy, they're all friends with informants. They enjoy informants. They support informants. Their content is informant geared. So I get that. I, I, I expected all of that. that. That's how it goes. And I said that from my very first episode. <clears throat> Excuse me. So none of that surprised me. You come with the territory. And, and that's that's the nature of the game. And then you just decide how you how you're going to deal with it. For me... There's nothing really to deal with. It has no effect on me. Uh, these people are insignificant in my world, in my life, and, and the way I uh, measure people's worth. They just have no relevance, so it is what it is. It's how it goes. We keep moving on. When I feel like addressing things, I'll address it. When I don't, I won't. It's as easy as that. It's not that big a deal. As I say, anybody who who wants to debate, confront, come have a discussion with me, I'm at my office almost six days a week, unless I'm out on sales calls or meeting with clients. So they're welcome to stop by. They're welcome to call, make an appointment. That's the best I could do. But that's neither here nor there. That's not even on my radar. I um, I, I don't care about those who who don't agree with what I say. I don't care about those who are against what I'm doing. Again, irrelevant. I'm not doing what I'm doing for anybody but myself. And uh, that's the bottom line, even for the people I care about. Yeah, part of it's for them, but the truth is it's for myself, what I feel I need to do. Sometimes in life, something hits you and you just feel like, okay, I need to do that. Well, that's where I'm at. This is something I need to do. Now, professionally and personally, did I need to do this? No, it it doesn't make me any money. It only costs me money. Uh, There's no benefit to it. There's a lot of aggravation to it. But the truth is, That kind of aggravation is like nonsense to me. That doesn't get me worked up. It doesn't even affect me. So for me, what's more important is getting the word out there, connecting with listeners. I met a lot of phenomenal people, um, phenomenal individuals, really good people that I never would have known. So I I take uh, solace in that, and and I'm grateful for that. And and that's what keeps me motivated. That's what keeps me going. But when people... uh, what people don't understand is the law is majority of it is all about interpretation and applying the law to the circumstance. Some judges get it right. Some judges get it wrong. And they have the system in place where you have the appellate division, the superior court division to, to oversee those things, to make sure that the lower courts do get it right. And that's, that's really where it counts. So regardless Let's look at it this way. We have, as far as the case of Crea, Londonio, Caldwell, Madonna, the appeal, we have our appeal date. Um, and now it's a matter of you submit the, the brief, you show all the inconsistencies, everything we did up to this point from day one, we're going to be citing. You have to show 
uh, what was incorrect based on the law. You have to show the court minutes. There's a lot involved. Now we did the Rule 33 with all the podcasts, so that's all included. You have to show all those things, and and to whittle it down, you're basically trying to tell the appellate court, hey, this these defendants didn't get a fair trial as it relates to the, the law, and here's why. And that'll be our argument. <clears throat> now, we're all very confident on that. We have a great team. We have a, a seasoned appellate lawyers involved, and we're all confident. And we'll see how it goes. And the only thing that matters is the opinion of those three judges, nothing else. Not what, what goes on here, not what, what goes on when we push back. None of that matters on that level. Once It's really just in the judge's hands. So that's why I say why all this is great. I'm not delusional where I think this is going to have any impact on any kind of appellate decision. It's not the case at all. Uh, the appellate court judges or any judge is not sitting, listening to podcasts and having a podcast uh, in any way, shape, or form influence their educated opinion and their educated uh, response to a brief or to a motion. It's just not going to happen. That's, uh, they're intelligent people. They're not going to get swayed by somebody like me on a podcast talking. So I have no delusions about any of that. My point is, that is just a, um, it's really just a segment of what the we push back, what I'm doing on my podcast is on the bigger picture of things. What I'm trying to do here in the most simplistic form is educate people. And when I say educate, it's not like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm edu-. No, it's, I'm using that t- term very broadly. I- I'm offering an additional source of information. I'm offering a different point of reference. I'm offering information that people could say, all right, that's one way of looking at it. I never looked at it that way. Oh, really? This took place? Oh, really? That took place? That's the whole point of this. It's about exposure. It's about bringing things to light that the general public's really not aware of normally. And that's the goal, and that's why I feel we push back is so important, because you're bringing bringing things to light that never would have got to light. For example, I have that gentleman on my show, Bill Fenton. He wanted to refute many lies spread by informant John Panisi. There's going to be a follow-up to that episode uh, with another party involved who also has additional lies that John Panisi keeps keeps, uh, spitting out. And there's another example. You have a a lying informant, John Panisi, doing polls on his page, right? So what does he do? He obviously don't like what I'm doing. He don't like the information I put out. He probably got all banged up that... Bill Fenton was on and and totally uh, knocked his lies out of the water. So what does he do? He puts up a picture of my father. He does a poll, and you got all the simps uh, uh, weighing in on the poll. And (laughs) I laugh at that. Do they think that means anything? The audience of a lying informant who beats women, okay, who, well, there's a few other things that went on after that I can't get into because it's part of the appeal, But who has a problem with women? Let's just put it that way. There's always an issue with women, whether it's stalking women, we're knocking their teeth out. There's always a situation. Does he think that poll, would I expect anything else? I guarantee that poll says, yeah, he's guilty. (laughs) It's common sense. You have have an informant putting up a poll. Obviously, everybody who's subscribed to this informant believes every word out of his mouth, hook, line, and sinker. They're starstruck. That's not my demographic. That's not the audience I appeal to. I I don't care about these elementary polls to try to get rises out of people. I could do my own poll if I want. I'll put up a poll that says that John Panisi knocked his girlfriend's teeth out, and I'll show some documents to support that poll. I actually did an episode on it. People could listen to the episode, and then they could decide if he did or didn't and burnt somebody's hair. Then people could decide. I could do my polls as well, but what does that do? What does that do? That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to put out my information... I'm here to explain things that I've experienced within the law, and I'm here to talk about my interpretation of how things will work. And that's why I laugh when people are like, oh, he said this, this is wrong, or that's wrong. Who's telling you it's wrong? Uh, somebody's interpreting it differently? Yeah, of course. That's why That's why you have the process. They must have never stepped foot in a uh, courtroom. Because think about it. If they stepped foot in a courtroom... They would see one motion given by the uh, defense, which cites all kinds of case law, all kinds of um, uh, 
segmented law, whereas they'll be able to cite the actual location within law books, within Westlaw, within Lexis, whatever it may be. They would see that and be like, oh, they won the case. They cited all these things. They're 100% right. Well, they must have never not stepped into court, to a courtroom because that's one part of the process. Now, the prosecution submits their brief or their motion in opposition to the defense and cites all of their case law and cites all of their notations from various uh, sources. And then it's up to the judge to read it all, interpret it, and decide what they feel falls in line with the law and to make sure whatever motion they deal with is applied toward the law in their opinion. That's what it boils down to. So I just laugh when people try to come out and say, oh, you got this wrong. I didn't get anything wrong. That's how things work. That's my interpretation of the law as it applies. Those are the steps I laid out as they apply to find out certain things. Now, you could argue it. You could say you wouldn't find it that way. Okay, welcome to the legal system. That's how it works. You have people on both sides arguing different things. You have prosecutions all the time. A prosecutor arguing one point. A defense attorney arguing another point. Then it's up to the jury and the judge. Now, I know I'm not going to appeal to the judge. So that's out of the equation. It's not even on my radar. So the small step I could do, the small contribution I could give is to appeal to the open-minded public. Not the public who just believes every word out of an informant's mouth uh, because they're starstruck, because they're, uh, you know, they're running clip channels where they're putting up uh, clips of organized crime guys every day because they're fascinated with these guys. No, that, that's not who I'm appealing to. Those are their own little world where they idolize a certain type of individual. That's not what I appeal to. They have their, you know what? There's a perfect example of how it works. They have their way of viewing things. All of the people who are in line with the lying informants, who believe every word out of their mouth. They have their own way of viewing things. And then I have a different way of viewing things. I try to look at it from the defendant's side, from the fact side, from the uh, discovery side, from the information given to me side. I try to use all of that to offer to my audience why I interpret things the way I interpret them and why I conclude the way I conclude. And, and that's what kind of... I think on social media, there's a huge disconnect where people are are right fighters in a lot of issues where there's no definitive right or wrong. It's interpretation and it's opinion and it's knowledge base and it's how you reach the, those facts, how you reach those conclusions. You have to have some, stup, some substance to clarify and to reason why you, why you came to the final deter, determination you came to. You can't just say, well, I saw this, I saw that. I'm looking at the Okay, what is it that you're looking at? Did you investigate it? How far did you investigate it? Again, did you order the minutes? Did you go for the expense of ordering all of those hearing minutes? Did you go for the expense of ordering all the motions on a case, if they're talking about a case? Did you go through all the motions? Did you read... All of the different evidence and all the different arguments that the defense may have made prior to trial to fully understand the evidence or lack thereof. 90% of these people never did that. And, and to me, it's amusing. They voice these strong opinions and they're so certain on things that they really have no idea about. If you start asking them, okay, what happened at this hearing? Can you tell me the minutes at that hearing? Can you tell me who was present? Or say you start asking them about a motion. Can you tell me about that mo motion that was submitted? Did you see that the prosecution agreed that the transcript they gave was inaccurate and they had to re redo the transcript because you proved that the wording and the verbiage they were trying to cite in that audio was not an accurate depiction? And, that, and that's why I, I tend to not offer my opinion on things until I really understand the whole picture for myself. I want to understand all the elements and all the factors of play and then I make my conclusion. And again, it's my conclusion. It's myself weighing all of the information that's available to me, everything that I've come across, and then concluding. It's interpret interpretation, very similar to what goes on in the legal system. And that's what I want jurors to understand. Do not have the prosecution, do not have the defense tell you how to interpret something. Use your common sense. Use your reasoning, use your logic, look at the evidence. 
weigh the credibility of the lying informant that may be in front of you. Or if it's not a lying informant, it's just an informant, weigh their credibility. But when you see, you can't be blind to something when you're a juror. If you know that an informant on the stand has committed perjury prior, like John Panisi did, admitted on the record, committed perjury uh, in his first case, that should weigh heavily. It's all about credibility. A lot of these things should be about credibility. And, and even on, on uh, YouTube, you get a lot of people with a lot of opinions. But when you look at what have they have accomplished in life, what's their credibility? What have they done to warrant this strong opinion? I don't know. I see a lot of people. It seems like those who make the loudest noise, who has a rap sheet from the, you know, uh, uh, I don't even want to get into what the charges are, but who has these rap sheets with these charges, who, who uh, fake suicide for attention, who, you have to weigh all this, cred the credibility factor. You have to weigh all these things. I saw another article when I was doing some research on some of these um, uh, individuals who were behind a lot of this nonsense. Uh, he choked his girlfriend and over a text message. A lot of stuff. And I'm not getting into it. I, uh, that's not what I'm here for. But my point just is, I find it amazing that people become an authority on YouTube. Take myself, for example. I'm not an authority. I'm not out here telling you uh, this is all. I'm not an authority at all. I give you the experience I have based on the credentials I've had, based on the cases I've been involved in, and based on the personal experience that have come my way. That's the insight. I'm not on here trying to uh, convince everybody that everything I say is 100% gospel. No, a lot of what I say is up for interpretation, but it's important that people understand that side of the interpretation, that people understand that perspective that I'm giving. Not because my opinion is so... Uh, important, just because that side has not had a voice yet. I haven't come across channels that explore things in the way I explore them, give you insight, and I'm sure they're out there, and I'm sure uh, ho hopefully they are out there and I can find them and, and make them join We Push Back. But my point is the more people doing that, the, the more you're equipping yourself, if you're a listener, to really be ready to, to judge a situation fairly to try to put your personal bias aside, to try to put your feelings of, well, oh, this guy's a bad guy and all bad guys should be locked up, putting that aside. That's not the point. I'm not here telling you this one's a saint, that one's a great person. You'll never hear me talk. You don't even hear me tell stories, personal stories. You don't hear me t talking about uh, my family. and so That's not what I'm here for. That's just not, not for me. That's all. There's nothing wrong in it. It's just not for me. What I'm trying to do is a little different. What I'm trying to do is just connect with the public who may see things a certain way and who may assume the legal system works in a certain way when it doesn't. That's what I try to explore. And I have guests on. Um, and I have, uh, I do episodes where I'll try to show videos or documentation to support my opinion and where I concluded. I'll try to walk the viewers through the different uh, through the different material to explain. Well, this is what it said. This is what happened. If you notice, all the episodes I did on uh, the lying informants, they're not opinion based based pieces in the sense that I'm not just turning on the microphone and it's me just rambling on my opinion. I'm I'm citing sources. I'm citing arguments. I'm citing events that took place. I'm citing articles. I'm giving as much information to the public that's available to me. And then it's up to them to decide what they think is truth, what they think is false, what they think is justice, and what they think is not. It's entirely up to the audience. This is not me here trying to gain subs to think the way I do and just to, to, to build a group of people who only think like I do. That, that's not what I'm here for. I, I want subscribers on both sides of, of the fence. I want subscribers who, who have an open mind, who are able to say, all right, what Dominic said here makes sense, but here not so much. Just to give people something to think about. Just to motivate people to understand that if they sign up to be a juror, it's a very important responsibility. And it's not one to take lightly. 
And it's one that the more information you have at your fingertips, the more prepared you'll be. And the greater chance the defendant will have of having a fair trial. That's all it's about, a fair trial. For those in the back who are a little slow and don't get it, it's about just making sure everything's weighed, making sure the charges fit the crime, making sure that the defendant being charged is being charged properly based on what he committed, he or she committed, not based on what they didn't commit. That's that's all it is in a nutshell. And the longer I'm on here, the those who are against what I'm saying, it's only going to intensify. doesn't bother me in the least. I welcome it. I welcome that. I like, I, I like that. I actually always, my whole life, I worked better under those conditions. Under doubt, under um, intense oppositional uh, statements, reactions. I, I, I've always worked better under those conditions, so it doesn't affect me in any negative way. And that's going to keep increasing. And that's just the way it goes. Part of the game. Don't come on YouTube I, for myself, I, I told myself, don't go on YouTube if you can't handle that. I knew it's not even something that I would lose a minute of sleep over, so it had no bearing, had no bearing on it. And I think the importance outweighs any possible adverse nonsense that goes on. And, and what people don't get, they think that their reach or their word has more of an expansion level than it really does. I could tell by what goes on in the real world. And, and people who listen to my podcast have no idea about these other podcasts bashing me or this and that. They're just more focused on the material. I'll get emails, oh, I heard your podcast, or, or I heard you on uh, Frank Morano's show, or I heard Matt Maury was on your show, things like that. Those are the people I appeal to. Those who want to come here they want to understand my perspective. They want to understand why I'm saying the things I'm saying. They want to understand what basis I have to say those things. That's how people grow, and that's where the podcast, I feel, will benefit the most individuals. If they come in with an open mind, if they come in with a closed mind, you know, I get all the BS, oh, it's a gangster sign, all that. Not. Well, I tell you what, anytime these people want to compare accomplishments and they want to compare resumes and they want to compare people they've helped... I'll gladly do that with any one of them. So they could say gangster son all they want. But if that's how they feel, what does that say about them? If they supposedly haven't achieved or accomplished one-tenth of what a gangster's son did, eh, it doesn't say too much about them, right? But that's how they are. There's people out there like that. That's how it goes. But in the real world, none of that even comes into play, people. I've been in business 20-something years. Never once did that even come up. Never once did somebody say, oh, but your dad's... It doesn't even come up. You're there to do business. If you provide the service the client wants, you provide it at the level they want, you you follow through on your word. If I promise a client I'll have something by Friday at 9 o'clock and I make sure they have it Friday at 9 o'clock, that's what counts. That's what people are dealing with. It's not like YouTube where... Uh, you know, they'll go, they'll pull up Facebook pictures, they'll do this, they'll try to say, oh, you know what, you jaywalked back in 1983. That doesn't exist in the real world, and that shows me these individuals have really not accomplished much in the real world because they don't know how it works. Their whole world is is this, is YouTube and creating... Vi That's their whole world, so they think it, it amounts to something. And it, it really doesn't when when you're dealing with issues that are way bigger than this whole YouTube nonsense and you're in a profession. Now, obviously, somebody like Joe Rogan and those podcasts, yeah, well, they're making millions of dollars. So their whole world is podcasting and God bless them. That'd be a great way to live, make a living, right? Talking on the radio or talking on a podcast, you can make a great living. God bless whoever could do that. That's phenomenal. But that's not why I'm here. Uh, my purpose has nothing to do with financial gains. It's about exposure. It's about helping those who need a platform, helping those who are being lied upon, helping those to get the other side of the interpretation, right? Right now, they're just only able to interpret one side. People listening can only say, ah, this is what this informant said. Ah, I guess it's true. Well, now they have something else to, to, 
to weigh and to measure and to decide the validity of it. And then they could make a conclusion. And that's why things like this are so important. And that's why we push back. I think we'll keep going even even if uh, I'm not as active as time goes by and say somebody else wants to take it over. I, this is evergreen. Something like this is evergreen because it's a concept. I told everybody, it's not about the members. It's about the concept. And whatever attention somebody wants to bring to important issues as it relates to injustice, as it relates to lies being told, that that's... That's why it will continue, because those are real-life issues. You have people who face a trial, and they don't even get a fair shot from day one. Everything's stacked up against them. Well, how do we fix that? Yes, you could try to change the law, and there's many organizations doing that. You have the NACDL. They're, they're, they're very involved in that. Um, there's organizations at a much higher level than myself, trying to get things right in the eyes of the law and how the law works. Uh, that's, that's not what I'm here for. That's not what I'm looking to uh, spend my time doing. I want to appeal on the one-on-one -on -one public basis. I feel the public holds the power. I feel those 12 jurors, that's who I'm appealing to. And they may not like me, they may not like me because of my last name, they may not like me for whatever reason. That's irrelevant. If they're open-minded people, reasonable people, intelligent people, they'll be able to separate that and they'll be able to, to go through the facts, go through the material, go through what I'm saying, compare it to other podcasts, compare it to a lot of what these lying informants say, and then they can conclude. And, and you've seen it play out. We've had... Um, some informants recently been caught lying, telling stories, and you have a lot of their uh, subscribers who are saying, hey, why are you lying to me? Why, you know, why are you BSing me? I, I believed you. You said he's telling them. People aren't dumb. The majority of people aren't dumb. There's a lot of idiots out there. We all know that. But the majority of the people aren't dumb. They're not going to want to have the wool pulled over their eyes. Once they see somebody's capable of just looking at them and lying and making up stories... The intelligent people will look at the bigger picture. They'll say to themselves, well, wait a minute. If he's lying now, how do I know he didn't lie on the stand? How do I know he didn't lie in his 302s? That's the bigger picture. And that's what people need to take a step back and think about and let it sit. And, and, and trust me, after this episode, I'm going to get probably more... Uh, uh, comments made about me from these creators, uh, more uh, community pages with, with links. Somebody put, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, that same stalker, the same, you know, um, uh, the guy from Silence of the Lambs, the Tim Foyle hat guy, the same guy, he even put a picture of myself that was in an article from uh, something I did a while ago. I was actually spotlighted in Westchester Magazine they had a, a magazine. I don't know if it's still around. It was called Westchester 914, I believe. I think it's still around. But anyway, they would spotlight different uh, businesses. And I was picked with uh, 10 other individuals, some successful individuals. And uh, they did a write-up. So what is the, <laughs> the content creator? I don't know. I guess he thought that was going to upset me. He took the picture from the article. He put it up. And then you have all of, all of his guys, you know, trying to knock me, trying to abuse me in the picture. Okay, again. What does that do for you? You got tough in a comment section in a uh, on a YouTube page? That that makes your day? Does that does that make you, your family proud? You, you're tough in comments? <laughs> it's, listen, it's comical. It's comical. But YouTube and, and all of social media, that's what you get. That's you get all different types of people, right? All different types of personalities. And you have to be able to deal with that. That's how it goes. It is what it is. You can't have it affect you. You can't have it uh, impact who you are as a person, how you respond to things. And, and that's why I wanted to do uh, today's show on the whole interpretation concept and how a lot of the people don't understand. They may say, well, if the law is written this way... Um, Obviously, it's very easy if, if, if it's in the law books and it's in uh, the different citations and it's in the different sources available, then that's the law. No, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on. 
There's a lot of ways of interpreting the law. There's a lot of ways of analyzing how it was applied and if it was applied correctly. And that's where you get into the nitty gritty of things. That's where people, that's what separates those who really know about the system from those who are on the outside looking in, they read a book or two and they think that they're uh, experts. That's not how it works. You have to grasp that the judge is ultimately responsible for interpreting and applying the law, especially during the motion phases of a case. The judge will field all the different motions. I'll give you an example, and I talked about this. In a case I was involved with, um, we submitted a 57-page brief that came with an affidavit from the number one source in the country on judge recusals. This guy tested, testified before the Senate hearing committees. A phenomenal resume. I mean, the guy's got pretty much the, one of the best in his field. He put together a 57-page brief, and at the end of the brief, he said, uh, in his opinion, his professional opinion, after going through all the facts, going through how the law is applied, that the judge should recuse himself from the case. The judge looked at it, read it, and said, well, I have a different opinion. And I'm the expert. I'll never forget that. The judge said, well, I consider myself the expert. So, right there, interpretation. Interpretation. Now, with something like that, you then have the opportunity to go to the appellate court and, and have that play out in front of the appellate judge and see if they decide that the judge should have been recused. See, these are all things that are then revisited at the, at the appellate level. But during trial, and when you're going through it, it's all up to the judge's interpretation. At least on the appellate level, you have three different individuals interpreting it and applying it. And even that, you may get two who vote yes and one that votes no, or two that vote no and one that votes yes. It's all about their interpretation, their opinion, and how they're applying the law. If the law was so black and white, folks, there wouldn't be the appellate division. There wouldn't be any of that. It'd be going through the textbook, no interpretation, that's it. No appeals, nothing, because the law was perfect and it was followed through perfect. It has to do with a variety of variables, whether errors were made, uh, whether somebody wasn't entitled to uh, a fair trial under the Constitution, and then citing with what hindered that, things like that. There's a lot of elements to the appeal. I'm talking about the interpretation aspect of it as applicable to the law. And people, I believe, from the outside looking in, I just wanted to really stress that point. So, because they'll see so many shows where somebody's talking so definitively and, and saying, this is how it has to be. This is, well, in real life, it don't play out that way. Even though they may interpret it that way, they may feel it's that way, they may feel they have the law be behind them, somebody else steps in, a judge or somebody, and interprets it totally differently. And then where you felt you were 100% correct, ah, you lost the motion. Somebody else viewed it differently. I've experienced that firsthand where the defense team, we would submit motions uh, with backup, with investigation backup, with transcript backup, many, many types of um, sources to cite to improve the credibility and the validity of our motion. And we would all feel, ah, this is a solid motion. We should get some relief on this. Boom, denied. Denied. Now, was the judge wrong? In our eyes, she was wrong. We'll find out on the appellate level if it's wrong, but it's all up to the interpretation. We felt she was wrong, and I, get, and I bet the prosecution felt she was right. Again, interpreted differently, applied it differently, looked at it differently. And, and a lot of the public doesn't grasp that. They don't grasp what's going on. That's why you'll see all these shows, these people know nothing about the law, who's, you know, who's, uh, has a bad drug habit, and they're on there, and they're citing laws, and this and that. Okay, what experience do you have? What case did you work on? What judge did you submit a brief in front of? What was the result? What motions? What type of motions did you put in? Did you put in an omnibus motion? Motion? Did you put a motion for dismissal? Did you put in a motion for a mistrial? There's so many things. You got to have a little experience before you get on a high horse and act like an oracle of a topic. You got to have a little something backing that up. And it can't just be, um, I'm on YouTube. You know, there's got to be a little more substance to it. And, and that's why... 
I, I really enjoy and I love having Matt Maury as a, as a member. If you haven't checked out his channel, go to View from Mulberry Street. And for all the members, uh, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying one's more important than the other. What I'm saying is Matt just brings the legal aspect to it, you know, from a criminal defense attorney's p perspective. Because his perspective is going to be different from mine. I'm not a, an attorney. I haven't experienced a quarter of what Matt's experienced. Not a quarter of it. And I don't have the knowledge that Matt has in that area. This gentleman has been around 45 years. So my point is, I'm just saying, when you have that, I, I was happy to have him be part of We Pushback because now we add another element uh, along the lines of, of, of my podcast. You know, you have another element just strictly geared on the justice system and what goes on. And that's all important. That's all important stuff. That's all important for the overall picture of We Push Back and bringing things to light. And that's why I enjoy all the different content creators because for me, that's what it's about. It's about the creativity. It's about people having a platform to point out lies. People having a platform where uh, if somebody's getting lied upon, a member of the public could actually reach out. If there's an informant on a podcast lying on them, a member of the public could reach out and say, hey, can you put me on? I want to set the record straight. That's why it's so important. Everybody has their own, own role. That's so important. And there's a lot of we push back members behind the scenes, folks. There's a lot of friends <laughs> doing things to bring attention, to, to spread the website. They don't have channels, but they want to help out. They help out in their own ways. And when you boil it da all down, all of these podcasts, it's really about exposure, right? It's about people wanting to get their content out into the stratosphere of YouTube. What they decide to do with it, it's up to them. Me, I chose the route of trying to appeal to the public, trying to appeal to jurors, trying to make them understand what goes on. Maybe they're not aware of certain things. And trying to enlighten people that even though you may think somebody who may be labeled something is just a bad person, that's your opinion. But if you believe in the law, then you should at the very least believe they're entitled to a fair trial. And if the evidence doesn't support the charges, there's a problem. That's all. And for those who, who don't believe that, so be it. They don't believe it. I don't appeal to that, that individual. It's not what I'm here for. And I want people just to really understand the, um, the concept of, of law interpretation and how it's applied and when it's applicable and how the judge really has all the power and their opinion when they're sitting on that trial, that's all that matters. Their opinion and their interpretation, that's all that matters. The defense could submit their brief, their motion, their memo. The prosecution could submit theirs or their rebuttal brief. And then it's up to the judge to read the ball, go through the different citations, go through the case law cited. I'll give you another example. In open court, I don't remember what... Uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember what the proceeding was, but I remember the statement the judge made. The... Defense cited a case, a case law case. Um, I don't remember the context of it. It just stuck out what the judge said. They cited a case law case, whereas a specific event had already taken place that was being addressed in this current case, right? So this specific event, something very similar already happened in a past case. So usually the judges like to see past case law to use as a guide to decide where they're going to conclude. And it was submitted, and you know what the judge said? When they were shown that case, they said, well, that judge got it wrong. You see what I mean? So it's not it's not ironclad. It's, it's as simple as a judge saying, oh, that's case law. Well, that judge got it wrong, and I think my way is right. And that's it, and that's what you're dealing with. And then if you feel they're still wrong, that's where you go to the appellate level, and you take it up on that level. But my point just is that I wanted people to think about in this episode is the interpretation of things, the interpretation of law, and the interpretation, you could apply that to anything. Just always make sure before you're concluding, before you're finalizing an opinion, try to get as much information from as many sources as you can all over the map. Don't just listen to things. If it's an important issue, just, just don't listen to information that's only in line with your way of, of thinking. Listen to to those who maybe you totally disagree with just to get their interpretation of the events, just to get their story. So then you could say, hey, you know what? They're completely full of crap. Or maybe you'll say, hey, no, I believe them.
but it's important that you get all those different sides. Especially, I, I'm I'm talking about the uh, you know podcast uh, in line with like uh, law and things of of that nature, where it's important to really get all the sides. But you could apply it to anywhere. You could apply it to anything. It's always good to get as much available available sources as possible before making any kind of final determination. And that's really all I wanted to talk about today, folks. I hope everybody enjoyed this episode. Till next time. You've been listening to the Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. And everything in between. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show and we'll be back soon until then find us on twitter facebook and instagram at justice tech pros to email the show with questions and comments it's podcast at justice tech pros.com till next time this is justice tech pros podcast and dominic crea signing off